The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Three-term incumbent Adrian Tissier is stepping down from the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. Four North County City Council members are running to replace her. And all four are here in a Penn TV exclusive to talk about themselves, their campaigns, and the issues. The game is politics. The game is on. I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. Term limits require Adrian Tissier to step down from the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors after 12 years of dynamic leadership. Her departure has touched off the first non-incumbent campaign since voters approved elections by district. And four city council members are running to tackle the tough issues facing the county. Housing prices, traffic, income inequality, and the fallout from unprecedented economic growth on the peninsula. Joining us for a special hour-long edition of the game are Helen Fisichero from the Coma City Council. Helen, thank you for being here. I'm doing this in a different order than I told people I was going to. Um, Mike Ingona from the Daily City City Council. I always like that you get to say city twice there. <laughs> David Canepa, also from the Daily City City Council, and Cliff Lenz from the Brisbane City Council. We're gonna start by asking each of them to tell us as briefly as they can, starting with you, Mike, um, why are you running? Well, that's a good one, as briefly as you can. First of all, I wanna thank you for inviting us all to be here. We don't get many opportunities to do this. Uh, I'm running for the Board of Supervisors in the 5th District because I'm from this community. I've seen the community change. It's the most diverse community in all of San Mateo County, and I've seen the changes that have happened in our community. Um, I've seen the, what, what's happened economically. There's people in my, in, in my neighborhood that are losing their houses. I believe that uh, the County of San Mateo and specifically members of the Board of Supervisors should be intent on being able to solve those problems that specifically about trying to peop, people to keep their houses and stay in the houses that they're in. I believe that if I get on the Board of Supervisors, I'll be able to address those issues, issues like uh, addressing affordable housing, traffic, um, and overall health of our cities, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that later on. Thank you. Helen. Well, thanks for having us. I appreciate being here as well, and I'm passionate about helping people and collaborating with people to get things done, and I've been on the city council in Colma for over two decades, so I have a lot of experience on the public sector. I have over 45 years experience in the private sector, uh, retired from pg and &E six years ago and continued on as an energy efficiency consultant, and also I've worked in San Mateo County for many nonprofit boards and commissions for the past 45 years, and I believe uh, that combination of experience um, will help me do a great job for this county as the next supervisor. Thank you. David. I'm a fourth generation uh, San Mateo County resident. I have a love and, and passion uh, for this county. Um, I've worked on um, numerous regional boards. Currently right now I sit as the vice mayor of Daly City. In 2014 I was the mayor. Um, I was unanimously elected um, by all the cities for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. This district has a lot of issues confronting itself, whether it's um, the operation, continued operation of Scene Hospital, which I was born at, whether it's uh, dealing with issues around um, health care affordability, whether it's the issues of dealing with income inequality. These are the issues that define this particular race. And so I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank both you and Kevin, and I'm excited about talking about what my vision for the county is. Cliff. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to thank Mark and Kevin for the opportunity to be here on the game. I think we all agree that San Mateo County is an amazing place to live and work. And as a supervisor, I'm committed to keeping it that way, but making sure it's that way for everybody. Though you live in one of the most prosperous counties in the country, we still have many people who struggle to make ends meet. It isn't just the working poor, but the middle class. You know, many people do not know what the county does or what is the role of the supervisor. But for me, it's the place to be. Because not only does the county provide that social safety net for the most at-risk members of our community, but I think it has tremendous potential to unite our cities and take on some of the biggest challenges that we face, like income inequality, lack of affordable housing, traffic and transportation, drought and sea level rise, helping our seniors to be able to age with dignity, and helping our kids to be successful in life. 
I mean, this is why I'm running. I want to be part of this team that's taking on these challenges and making a difference in people's lives. I don't think you can find a better place to serve at, than at the county level. So that's why I'm running. So I, I'm curious if I could just jump in um, and talk a little bit about the campaign. All of you are experienced um, officials running campaigns on the city level. How has the experience of running at the district level for a county seat uh, been different from city council? And I, I sort of have a little bias, uh, which maybe you can dispel, that voters certainly know a city council, they know who the mayor is. There's sometimes some confusion about what a county supervisor is, that you are an elected official at the county level. Have you had to educate voters at all about the role of being, of what a county supervisor is, and then explaining to them why why you're the, the best one? Have, have you had that experience? Who wants to go first on that yeah, question? I can go for Absolutely, Fine. we've had to do that. You know, I've gone so far as to take the map with me to show people mm -hmm. Uh, where the where the district lines are, trying to explain that uh, the southernmost border is Sneath between uh, Junipero Serra and Skyline, and walk in those precincts and getting to know those people. Um, you know, they look at you and they go, "You're from Daly City. What are you doing here?" And uh, it, it's it's been an interesting road walking those walking those precincts and actually, you know, telling them you know what I've been doing. You know, for 23 years in Daly City, uh, facing the electorate 10 times. Uh, it's been less difficult to get my name out and get my recognition out. So um, telling them what the issues are, telling them exactly what, what I want to do when I get there, and specifically to tell them that, that years ago I represented their interests as it relates to transportation on the SAM Trans Board. I chaired both the SAM Trans Board and the Transportation Authority in this building and worked very hard on a few things. Um, I believe that we worked together in 2004, we worked on the reauthorization of Measure A, that half cent sales tax. We worked very hard and, and actually went into the community and, and passed the word on that. Uh, when SAM Trans uh, went to the, uh, to the airport, uh, a bar to the airport. That was a, a subcommittee that I served on with Jerry Hill and uh, and uh, Mike Nevin, and it's been a really great opportunity to be able to work in those boards and commissions. You tell them a little bit about your your, your background um, and what you've done on the on, on the county level. Working for PCE has been uh, as as new with the Peninsula Clean Energy, um, and working with uh, the Bay Area um, uh, Water Bosca. So the issues. That, that we face in our community are issues that I'm already facing as a regional representative to those. So, okay. yeah. Who else? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, you know, not, I've, since December 1st, I've knocked on almost 5,000 doors since, uh, you know, um, you has, know it, has somebody been home in every one of them? <laughs> you know, more than 50% of the people have been home. No kidding. Absolutely. That's so, pretty amazing. Yeah, and, and all across the district. <clears throat> and so, if I'm in South San Francisco or the Broadmoor Village or Daly City, you know, of course, I introduce myself as the mayor, but then, you know, I tell them I'm running for San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. I really highlight the county part. And then I talk about, you know, the things that the county is involved in, if they're taking public transportation, SAM Trans. If, um, you know, they, uh, they probably wouldn't get in trouble with the law, but if, you know, someone did in their community, they would go to the county jail. Um, there are a lot of people uh, in North County who need county services. And so they are connected, <coughs> you know, whether it's through healthcare or getting uh, financial aid or food aid. So um, my role as a supervisor, I tell them, is to be that conduit, to help connect them better with those services. And that message resonates with them. And so uh, because of that, you know, I've been able to really make strong inroads in areas that uh, that I'm not from, like Daly City or South San Francisco or, or uh, San Bruno. And, you know, it's been so phenomenal. A, yeah. a lot of splaining, it sounds like. You do. That's right, Lucy. Yeah. So I've enjoyed meeting all the folks that I've actually connected with. We've been walking um, the 93 precincts. We've connected with them with a coffee program, so they've had the opportunity to meet me as a candidate. And the great thing about meeting the great people of this district is they all have different questions about what the county does, similar to what the two gentlemen have already spoken about and the safety net services comes up more often than not. Um, and then they bring up issues in their own community and I take a lot of notes on that and then bring that back, you know, promised, and I have done, 
uh, bringing that back to the local. A lot of the issues they bring up are local safety issues. You know, they want to stop sign or there's traffic issues or um, they couldn't get into their recreational program. Whatever it is, I'm taking notes and getting that back to the right person. When it has been a county issue, I've connected with Adrian's aide and that person has gotten back to the voter or the resident uh, citizen to um, respond back. And um, as I said, many of the issues are local city issues. It's great for me um, educating um, the voters one person at a time uh, exactly what has been said of what the county does, because it is confusing. And in this district, we have some unincorporated area, which is directly connected to the county. And then there is the other services that's, that uh, blankets the rest of the district. And um, the people have been very receptive. And I've gotten even the comments, yeah, I've never gotten an invitation to come meet the candidate. Usually the candidate um, is, you know, is unreachable. And uh, I love meeting people. I love hearing what their thoughts and ideas are and then bringing and taking that and solving some problems. That's a, that's a tremendous, tremendous question. I've had the opportunity uh, to walk um, 15,000 doors, but I think there's a disconnect. And what I'm proposing if elected um, to the Board of Supervisors is a total paradigm shift. And what that paradigm shift is, is to take, and they do this in Alameda and Contra Costa County, and they do it rather well, is to take the office that exists in Redwood City and to put it in the district, whether it's in Brisbane, Colma, Broadmoor, portions of South City and San Bruno. By doing this, and they've done it in these other so counties. When you say there's a disconnect, you think the people in North County don't feel connected to county government. No, I'm saying? not saying that. What I'm suggesting to you is clearly this, is that if you take a bus from Daly City or you take it from North County, it takes about an hour and a half, two hours. It's a long ride. Well, we are working yeah. on it. And then what I, and, 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 and <laughs> no, it's, 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 cer it's certainly not you. It's, cer it's, it's certainly not you. Actually, it is. And, <laughs> and if you drive down, if you drive down, it's 45 minutes. And so we have uh, Peninsula Works, we have the Mike Nevin Healthcare Center, we have all these resources located in our district. And what I'm gonna be focused on is what can we do to deliver the best constituent services? And the way you do that is locating the office um, in the district. And I'll just close with this. Um, I've talked with different counterparts. It's worked rather well. What happens is dip department heads they come into the district. So you set up a meeting at, at the office, they come and they tour. And I think what I want to focus on if elected is making sure that we provide the best constituent services. And I think having the office located there accomplishes that. I want to go back to use or disconnect. What did you mean by that? What I mean by disconnect is people don't know exactly the, what the services are being provided from the county because they're all the way in Redwood City. If we were able to create a program and create an office where there's various outreach, okay. that, would, that would create a connection. And I think that's the benefit of district elections, having, a, you know, having that office in your district. And I'm going to fight for that. Okay. Well, you know, you know talking about disconnect, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that is something that I've experienced you know, outside of, of Brisbane. You know, and maybe because Daly City is bigger. But, um, you know, many times I'll go to someone's door and I'm the first person that's ever asked for their vote. Um, they sometimes feel that, that the government isn't listening to them. And so as, as a supervisor, you, know, you want to be that conduit. You, know, you want to be that conduit that, that's connecting the services to the people that need them. Using the uh, existing nonprofits like the Daily City Partnership, they've done a fabulous job of connecting with the communities of Daly City, that needs to be further enhanced. And I think when, you know, if you're going to be in public service, you gotta be willing to get your hands dirty and get into the weeds and really listen to what people are concerned about. And that's, and that's community by community and neighborhood by neighborhood. You know, that, he brings up an important point. I think the, the next, board of super, next member of the Board of Supervisors in this district has to have some sort of a, a um, uh, a, a record of working with nonprofits and working with, with other groups to get legislation passed. And let's be specific. Uh, in Daly City, I got a chance to work with the Youth Leadership Institute to pass legislation to limit payday lending, um, an issue that bubbled up from the top that came from them um, and had them talk about and actually go out and do surveys. They did a presentation with us. I worked very, very diligently with them, and I was able to convince my colleagues on the on the on the, um, the council to actually pass 
that legislation. We did uh, uh, health initiatives. We worked with the health initiative. We worked with Breathe California. Breathe gave us, uh, gave us resolutions that were passed in other areas like Contra Costa County. We passed a, 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 an anti-smoking law. Um, we worked with SAMCAR of all groups. SAMCAR, um, we're going to work with them to basically get them to agree that we would be able to regulate smoking and control secondhand smoke in residential uh, areas. So we were able to do that, and then we extended it to, uh, to e-cigarettes. And that was working with Breathe California, SAMCAR, together to deal with a legislative issue and actually pass legislation. So I'm proud of that, and those are the kinds of things, like, I'll give you one quick one. Department of Public Health, we've worked with the county, the city worked with the county just recently to pass Vision Zero. Vision Zero. Now, if you're not familiar with Vision Zero, it's a, it's a bundle of policies that, that looks forward to um, uh, controlling traffic deaths by the year 2030. Um, San Francisco has passed it. Um, I believe we're the first city in, in San Mateo County. Uh, uh, San Mateo has passed parts of it, but it's a comprehensive effort with public works, um, our police, and, um, and our community to try to get the word out that um, uh, traffic deaths in our, our should be should be uh, stopped in our area. So okay. that's what we worked on. Okay. And, and I agree that government can't do everything. It, you have to collaborate with the nonprofits. I've sat on the HIP housing board for nine years where they did a lot of um, outreach to the communities to, to get people to work together as far as home sharing. The home sharing program is very successful. They house over a thousand families in San Mateo County. Um, I sit on the Housing and Community Development Committee as well, which does a lot of leveraging with the nonprofits. They know how to do it on a, on a dime. I mean, they're, they're amazing people that work for the nonprofits. And having the nonprofits work with the government because the fact that the government can't be everywhere, that's the partnership we need to, with the community in order to get the safety net services to everyone that, that, that are telling us about this as we're walking door to door. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to start uh, dialing in on some of these other tough issues. These have been the easy ones so far. <laughs> Stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. And around us, we have the four candidates for the District 5 seat on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. We're trying to talk about the issues now. Um, housing and traffic, traffic and housing. It seems like those are the one and two interchangeably. Let's talk about housing first, because everybody says there's a solution for it. What's the role of the county? What are you going to do about it? And realistically, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Mark, housing continues uh, to be an issue. Um, rents are at an astronomic rate. Um, people are just struggling day by day to live. And as I've walked the cities, um, that's the message I've heard, the affordability issue. And I'm the only candidate proposing um, a different idea to deal with housing. And what that is, is what San Francisco just accomplished on the ballot this past November. And that's creating a $312 million housing bond. When we talk about the Grand Boulevard, we talk about from San Jose to Daly City, we have tremendous, tremendous opportunity. But the issue that we have, and Daly City has been able to deal with it, is how do we create capacity? And what I'm asking for is to create housing around transportation corridors and that being funded through an affordable housing bond. As Michael attests to, Daly City continues to lead uh, San Mateo County um, in the creation of affordable housing. We just approved um, 212 units of senior housing. Um, in addition to that, um, we've um, engaged with Mid Peninsula Housing on Mission Street. So we're taking a blighted area, which was once a blighted area, and we're transforming it to a livable, walkable community where seniors um, are able to, to, to congregate and where um, people can really have access um, to to transportation. And so these are the exciting things that we've done in Daly City. I want to take it countywide and I want to do it big through an affordable housing bond. Well, that's something specific. Who's got something specific. specific they're going to do? Yeah, so because everybody thinks 
Yeah. Well, you know, can we build our way out of this problem? Is it, is it possible to build enough housing to impact the cost of housing here? So when you look at where is the housing going to be built, it's not going to be built in, in, on county land. That's going to be built in our cities. And so the last thing that the supervisor should do is tell the cities what they should do with their land use policy. But every city has a general plan, and in that general plan is a housing element. And within that housing element are goals for affordable housing. And so, um, you know, you and I sit on that, um, that, uh, uh, that housing task force the, between jobs and, and housing and trying to understand, okay, how can we create the housing that's necessary to uh, keep up with the jobs that we are creating? And so looking at what are those goals and helping to be able to find, find funding, uh, best resources to help those cities to achieve their ho housing goals. Uh, we have also a lot of stock uh, that is existing, that you know, where you have a senior who's living by themselves. They could use someone to help them out with chores or, or extra money. And then you have someone who could use some affordable housing, so it's partnering them up. HIP Housing has a great program, but we are not utilizing that program to its full uh, capacity. And as a county supervisor, I want to make that more of, of um, uh, some that we offer. And then, of course, there's the community colleges who have this great workforce housing model. And we have school districts, don't have a lot of money, but they have, they're rich in land. And we have a teacher shortage. We cannot pay our teachers enough to do the jobs. They're, they're, not, um, they're not signing up. But for what it sounds like, though, it sounds like those are all issues cities have to deal with. How does the Board of Supervisors deal with it? So, you, so the supervisor needs to understand what's in that housing element, working with the council members, working with the planning department of the various cities. You can't tell the cities what to do, but you can assist and support their goals. And then by working together, bringing in the different agencies that can help, along with the school districts, then you have an opportunity to make something happen. The city of Brisbane wants a member of the Board of Supervisors to tell them what should be in their housing well, element and how to carry it out? I think part of this is you got to know what the Board of Supervisors is doing now. And I think my assessment was that it's since 2013, the board's allocated over $23 million for the construction of affordable housing in the area. Three million of the, of the renovation expansion to local shelters, including funds allocated for the 2016-2017 cycle of $30 million. So their housing fund has created some affordable housing in the area, and it's worked with cities like us. We've been able to get Measure A, measure a funding for, uh, money for, for, for uh, situations like what David had mentioned, um, working with Mid Peninsula. So it's not just working with your nonprofits. It's working with the nonprofits and working with the county and knowing where the money is. You can't ask for the money but, if you don't know where it's at. What does working with mean? Because everybody says they want to work with. Collaborate. I mean, okay, so Cliff talked about everybody has a housing element. Daly City has a housing element. We have what's called a housing endowment trust fund. Basically what we do is we make developers do a portion of their, of their area to be affordable, 20%. We've been able to create 66 units that are gonna uh, last five years that are forever gonna be affordable. We've got $5 million in our housing endowment trust fund. So when I say working with, we say to the county, all right county, you have, an, you have a vision for building affordable housing, so do we. Well, we have money to build affordable housing, so do you. We hear number 213, we hear 66. Doesn't sound like that's going to get make much of a dent, Helen. It's well, smart. when I, I'm actually on the committee that has actually made the recommendations to the, the, the Board of Supervisors, the Housing and Community Development Committee. And uh, we use federal, state, and county money, and that's leveraged with all these nonprofits like Bridge Housing. Um, uh, Habitat for Humanity, Mid Pen, Mercy. Mercy Housing is getting ready to build a veteran uh, building in Colma, um, in front of the Holy Cross Cemetery. It is true that with this housing element that is in every city, the other glitch in it is most of that land is owned by private people. They're not owned by the cities. So it is a collaboration of working with the owner of that property, working with the city, working with the county, get finding out where you can leverage all these dollars to assist them and encourage them to build because it's up, sometimes they don't want to build because they just want to sit on it. And that's really hard for our first responders, our teachers, our, 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 um, our public safety people. They don't, well, most of them don't live in this county. They drive a long way to get to work, to and from work, and that congests our, our highways. So the, the transportation hubs that are recommended, 
they're not going up fast enough. And when we had the recession, everything stopped for a while. You look at Redwood City right now, many people were, uh, I've talked to are flipping out because all this construction's going on, but these were housing um, projects in the queue, and it just so happened everything happen is happening at once. And I believe having community <coughs> meetings and communicating to your community on an ongoing basis, telling them what's coming, what it's, how it's gonna impact, get their input into the project, you get everybody talking at the table, you can mediate a lot of things and get things moving forward in the right direction. Yeah, and that's why my solution, okay. Mark, that's why my solution is solid. Because what my solution does, and it's gonna work and we're gonna implement it if I get elected to the Board of Supervisors, it, it can bring on about 5,000 to 10,000 units. So it specific, specifically addresses what you're talking about. We talk about the creation of housing. Right now, the way we're doing it is we're piecemealing it. We're piecemealing it. And in terms of the amount of housing for the funding that is given, we're not meeting the goal. And so what this bond does is bond says, hey, let's look at putting 5,000, 10,000 units. Let's take San Bruno. Let's see what we can do with areas that are underutilized through the Grand Boulevard plan. And that's why I think moving that forward would be great for San Mateo County. And the voters have to put skin in the game too. Do the voters want to do this? What are the voters' values? And I think it addresses your situation in terms of input. How do you get communities, communities input? What you do is you put it on the ballot and the voters support it, the voters support it, and they say affordable housing is important. And so I think it's not just elected officials. What do our residents, what do communities think? And I think the best way to measure that is through a bond. So Dave, I'd like to ask you a question with this bond. Sure. So let's say it passes. How are you going to get these property owners that own the private land to agree to build housing? Sure, like we've done in Daly City. Let me tell you, it's called land banking, Helen. You're going to have the funding for, for, for this new construction. You're going to be able to make the acquisition of land. It happens all the time. You can use it through state, federal dollars. Mike, as you know, we've done that um, in Daly City on, on a couple of properties. But you're not answering the question. How are you going to get that private property owner to say, I want to build housing here and give me some of that bond money? Well, first of all, it's it's you're, you're getting you're a little confused. There's two separate two separate steps. The first step is is like they do with the land trust. They purchase the property once the county owns it, whoever owns it, they're able to develop how they want to. So, I understand that, yeah. but you keep saying they're going to purchase the property. How will they convince the private landowner who sits on it? And that's what the problem is in all the cities. They're sitting on land. They want to build it, whatever they want to build, when they want to build it. You're trying to, to get into it. eminent domain, aren't you? I so, am. Yeah. So, 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 so no, we're not going to. We're not. We're not going to eminent domain it. But let me give you an example, and Mike can attest to it. There Maybe. Was, there, <laughs> tell him he has there, there's several. No testing so it. we're not going to eminent domain it, but what we're going to do is we're going to see what the fair market value is. It's been being done in San Francisco. They're creation, creating new housing. So if they can do it in San Francisco and it's our neighbor next door, why can't we do it in San Mateo County? All right, let me give you an example of, of where the county can help. And you talked about, you know, the, you, you made a comment to uh, Mike about, oh, okay, the, the Board of Supervisors can tell Brisbane, you know, how to do its housing. No. So what we did was we reached out to the county's health system department. The health system uh, department looks at land use policy and that's the way you create healthy communities. And so with our housing element, we are looking at a 25 acre area that we're not gonna rezone, we're not gonna take away the, the property owner's rights, we're gonna do a zoning overlay, create a higher value than what currently exists. That provides the incentive to do the housing. And, but in order to engage our community to say that housing is a good thing, workforce housing for our first responders, for our teachers, you know, that person that pours you a cup of coffee. People who work in your community should live in your community. And so by identifying how you build a healthy community, you have housing, of course, near amenities, near transportation. And you put it together in a precise plan. That provides your city with a vision. As a supervisor, I can share those best practices with other cities, with other communities. Then it provides assurances for the property owner, okay, if I develop my project, if it within the criteria of your precise plan, I have a project. So that then helps move the process along and provides that political will to, to make it happen. So, so Mike, first of all, I assume you <laughs> wanted somebody besides David speaking for you. <laughs> well, um, yeah. But uh, you know. let me ask you, what we're talking about is persuasiveness. And, yeah. and I guess the question is, how do you convince a city 
that doesn't want any building taller than five stories, that they really should put up a 10-story building on El Camino. Let me tell you how you do that. Um, you know, my entire life I've been working as an advocate. My, my job is I'm a, I'm a criminal defense attorney. People hire me to speak for them and to get other people to believe their story or to, to, that, that they're, they're not guilty. Um, my job on the city council has always been to advocate. And as an advocate, you are, you, you are out there, you're trying to create a, as large a tent as possible. This is part of the body of work that I've had and part of the, the kinds of things that we do on the council. Um, when, when you were specifically talking about um, the, the housing, um, this housing bond you're talking about, Dave, two things came up in, 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 in mind for me, and that is, what is the Board of Supervisors doing um, as, as it relates to infill development? Are they buying houses up? Are they buying uh, surplus property up for the purpose of doing this? That is their own informal land banking. And the second thing is, what are our state legislators doing, and what is the relationship between uh, our uh, members of the Board of Supervisors and our legislative delegation? Is this something that, Kevin, we should be taking up on the state level? Um, and have they been talking uh, at all about what, doing one of two things, either another housing bond or revitalizing and making another redevelopment agency? You know, when we lost redevelopment, you all know what it did to us, you know, and we've been scrambling ever since to, 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 to determine how are we going to meet our affordable housing. So without that, that, uh, that tax credit, without the, the ability to re reinvest in your community, you've taken a tool away from us. And I'm asking uh, if there's any way that uh, our legislators on the state level could give that back to us. Well, and I think we'll get to that on another show. Because <laughs> the good news for all of you is that Kevin isn't running against you for this board yeah. meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask, let me shift gears a little bit. A lot of the property that is county unincorporated property has rental housing, especially in North Fair Oaks, down in that part of the county. Rent, renting, uh, rent costs are killing significant portions of our community. Do you support rent control? Do you support caps on rent increases? Do you support measures that give relief to renters? Don't all jump in on, <laughs> on that one. Yeah, you know, I'll start. You know, I'm a landlord. You know, I have a couple of units, and, you know, I, we purchased that property as an investment. I don't have a pension, so that's my wife and I's retirement. We have a couple of kids. We know how expensive it is to, to buy a home. Maybe they might want to live there one of these days. However, I know that this in investment also has responsibilities. You know, the people that I, I rent to, they're, they contribute to my community. They're my neighbors. And so there's that extra responsibility. Yes, you know, rent control is a very hot topic right now. And the best way to solve it, I think, is, is at the grassroots level. You need to have, you know, the folks that are the um, housing advocates, sitting down with the folks that are completely against rent control. When you have the two sides being very defensive and um, shouting at each other, no one's listening. And so what, what, you, what will happen is then you know, you'll get knee-jerk policy. You'll get you know, things on the ballot. Rather than having something that, uh, where both sides can be you know, finding a compromise. So you're, you're against rent control? Is that what you're saying? I would not advocate rent control as a supervisor, but I would, as a supervisor, be that mediator to get the sides to come up with something. I think what they have in the Westlake uh, apartment complex, that, that area, where they have a 10% cap, and they don't always charge a 10%. It's voluntary, of course, but you know, a lot of times they don't you know, that it's around 3% or 4%. At least what it does is gives the, the tenant, you know, assurances, that, you know, how much it's going to be. And it also gives the property owner, you know, they can forecast to do capital improvements, to, you know, have a return on their investment. This is what it is. So it, it, that's the role I think that the supervisor should play, is bringing the sides together. I agree. I'm, I've been a tenant. I'm a homeowner and I'm also a landlord. And there's good, there's good tenants and not so good tenants and there's good landlords and not so good landlords. The, the greed, greedy landlords make me crazy because when you hear these horrible stories happening where all of a sudden somebody has a thousand dollar increase in their rent and they have to move across the bay because they can't stay here, it's a very, very sad situation. But I think if any county can do it, and San Mateo County has proven it in other avenues, if they can bring the people together 
similar to what uh, Cliff is mentioning, you've got to get your renters, you've got to get your landlords, and um, you've got to get uh, someone to mediate. Maybe it's uh, well, what PCRC. Is it, what does the middle ground look like? Well, that's just it. You know, in Daly City, we've got the largest population of renters anywhere, and we have to get the largest uh, um, Westlake Village apartments. Mm -hmm. um, what's worked in Daly City has been this self-regulation that Cliff's talking about. Um, it, it, being on the city council for 23 years, you know, if if the rents, if if the problem was as bad as it has been, or it has been, it's being forecasted to be, then there would have been some wellspring, ground spring of of support for rent control, but instead there hasn't been. Um, but I have heard many of these kinds of stories about outrageous uh, uh, raises in rent. Now, what I would propose would be to determine the, the two differences, the difference between a person like Cliff, who, is, who owns a house and is a landlord for a single family home, and, and the larger the larger apartment type complex, because I, I don't, can't imagine what that number would be, but I do believe that those are different sensibilities, they're different issues, and, and you can actually deal with one issue without hurting the, the, the small business, I, I would call the small business owner or the single family, single renter uh, landlord. So I think that's something that I could look at. Um, I'm not for rent control, but I am for, uh, for uh, looking at things that, uh, that deal with injustice, and I think some of these are. Well, and, and I just want to add that... Well, that let, it, me, let me hold that thought, because okay. we're going to come back. I know you, you, you got cut off. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to stay on this topic, but stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. I'm Mark Simon, he's Kevin Mullen, and we have the four candidates for the District 5 seat on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. We're talking about rent control. So far, nobody's for it. Everybody's for people just getting together and sort of working this out. Helen? So I was going to add to it. I was visiting yesterday our second home that provides a lot of uh, countywide services to Daly City, Brisbane, and uh, Colma residents. And I was talking to the executive director, and she was saying that there are some of the employees, they don't live in the county. But they have to make a choice to come to work if it costs too much for the, because of their limited income and the way they're being gouged maybe in the East Bay um, of not coming to work because they don't have the money to pay for the gas in their car or for transportation. And I don't want that to happen to our residents in San Mateo County. So that's why I keep saying if we get the community together to talk about what a landlord, what it takes for a landlord to pay for capital gains, or capital gains, that's horrible, capital improvements on their property, as well as, you know, uh, how much money uh, folks are making that are renting in the building, and, and then find a, a happy medium that will work, you know, whether it is a, a percentage, no more than a, a certain percentage increase in rent. But it is true, the people that have purchased these homes to rent them out, a lot of them, that is their future income. And as Cliff was saying, he doesn't have a pension. That, that, you know, these are small business owners, and I've seen them at these meetings in San Mateo, city of San Mateo, and they're very frustrated. So we just need... And keeping everybody calm and having someone mediate that conversation is probably the best deal. So I'm absolutely opposed to um, any form of rent control or rent stabilization. What I'm hearing from um, some of my colleagues is that they're for a, for, for a, a cap on rent. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely opposed to that. I'm not convinced that um, rent control works. Let me give you two examples. Um, San Francisco and New York City. Uh, San Francisco continues to have um, the highest uh, rent in the state of California, in the United States, they have rent control. New York has rent control, and it continues to have um, high rents. Again, we're, I'm more of on how do we create inventory, and we've talked about it earlier, but the affordable housing bond does that. That's the practical solution. I think that's the solution that'll be moved forward. I do not see, and just hearing these comments and other comments from other elected officials, what took place in, in San Mateo, I do not see rent control um, really being implemented. I know East Palo Alto is the only city, I believe, that has it, but I really don't see uh, rent control in San Mateo County, and I'm opposed to it. 
So you can't really talk about affordable housing without uh, the flip side of that coin, which is traffic and congestion. Uh, we're talking about jobs, housing, balance here. I wanted to ask a question. We've got, in San Mateo County, lowest unemployment rate mm -hmm. in the state of mm -hmm. California. Yeah. Incredible economic activity, this, the center of the innovation economy, biotech, high tech, so forth, putting tremendous strains on our infrastructure in the county. Uh, policymakers at all levels trying to grapple with this. What could you do as a county supervisor um, to, to look at this issue in sort of a holistic way? How do we deal with traffic congestion? Mm -hmm. But on a broader level, how do we share the prosperity that is being created? in this county. There's tremendous wealth being created, but we have pockets of poverty and real need. How would you deal with that issue? Because underlying all of that is an income inequality um, that is taking hold in our county. Um, so lots on your plate. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you balance all of those According things? to EDD, um, the county of San Mateo has a 3% unemployment rate. That's the lowest um, in the state of California. When you contrast that to other counties, it, it gets up to 26%. But I think what you have to do is you have to look at a candidate's track record. And I've had the uh, opportunity to serve as the vice chair of the, the Transportation Authority, had the opportunity to look at east-west connections. For, uh, we're able to get the first shuttle in the city of Daly City, the Bayshore shuttle, which was a f uh, food desert. It was able to make that happen. The work we've been able to do um, around 101 and allocating the hundreds of millions of dollars. When I've served on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, getting $12 million uh, for Caltrain electrification. This comes through creating infrastructure. And if we have the right infrastructure, we could create the right throughput. If we do not have, we're at a tipping point. If we do not have the right infrastructure, what then happens is some of these companies may leave and go to other places. And I would hate to lose Genentex, I would hate to lose Oracle. And so we're at a tipping point in terms of policy. I think the other thing that's important, you talked about, we talked about the unemployment being at 3%, but as I've walked the district and heard the stories from South San Francisco to Brisbane, we have an underemployment problem. We have people working two or three jobs and they're just barely surviving. And if you ask me what pulls at my heartstrings, when you see multiple families living in a house because they can't afford to live. And so we need to see what we can do to create a living wage. And as the Board of Supervisors, I would make that happen. It's interesting. Well, let me, let me just interject real quick, just sure. for the sake of full disclosure. Yeah. Okay. I work for Sam Trans, Caltrain, and the Transportation yeah. Authority. Yeah. In fact, I've worked with some of these yeah. folks in that capacity, just, yes. just so there's full disclosure yeah. on the table. Go ahead. I Mike. was just going to mention that. I was just going to mention that, that because of the fact that I've been on the Transportation Authority and Sam Trans, uh, chaired both of those and have had the opportunity to work with leaders all over the county. You know, the Transportation Authority isn't, is uh, to, to determine what, how do you spend that Measure A money. For many years, I had to, 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 to wrestle with doing it equally and being able to determine um, why a grade separation in San Carlos is important to a fifth district, to a fifth district person in the north. You know, I mean, when I got when I got on the the, the transportation authority, we fought hard just to get that that John Daly uh, nor, uh, southbound merge to go. Um, so we'd go around the county, we'd talk about how it's important to 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 deal with these issues on a countywide level. Now, two things about traffic: one, HOV lanes maybe across the county, we should we should get those. The electric the electrification of the Dumbarton Rail is clearly something that might do something with traffic. Um, beyond that, I think we should t look to our Fed and state uh, representatives and see if we can get that kind of increased state transportation improvement funding. In Daly City, we have been aggressive in being able to get that money and basically coming up with good programs like um, uh, the Geneva Corridor, getting, making sure that we could get bulb outs and crosswalks. Um, basically, I think what we did was we put up $40,000 and got $3 million in, in, in transportation improvements. So it's being able to, to utilize what's already out there. There's a lot of stuff that's already out there that all you have to do is be able to utilize it, go out there, have a vision, work with your colleagues. That's another thing. You really have to, big ideas are great, but if you can't get three votes for them, you're nowhere. 
So you need to be able to work with your colleagues and have a track record. And what, the track record I'm talking about is working with them to get them to say yes on the record to legislation that you're going to pass. That's working with them. And I agree. Collaborating with the, all the Board of Supervisors members, I'm very fortunate to have the endorsement of Warren Slocum, Carol Groom, and Adrian Tissier. Um, uh, having that, that relationship, being able to bring to the table the, the fact that housing needs to be brought, uh, built around transportation hubs so that you get people out of their cars and onto Samtrans and BART and the train, then um, that uh, decongests the, the highways as well as providing some jobs uh, in the buildings, having some businesses on the first floor so people don't have to, uh, they can come easily and go easily without having to, to get in their cars and drive to a, a shopping center to do some of their day-to-day uh, -day business. And when planning the developments, um, they have to also include some open space and that'll, that'll satisfy, I think, the, ma the majority of the population working together and, and, being, and having some affordable housing. As we've said earlier, we keep repeating that over and over. But there are organizations in this county that work with the Board of Supervisors and then work with the communities to get this housing and get everybody out of their cars. So, Kevin, you know, so your question, you know, when you, when you talk about the lack of affordable housing, that's really kind of like the hub, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, it has all these ripple effects. So if people cannot afford to live where they work, they have to drive very far distances. That creates uh, intense pressures on, our, um, on, on, on traffic. You know, we have some of the worst traffic in the nation. And so when people have to drive very far distances, spending a lot of time in their cars, they're spending little time with their families. And when you're not reading to your kid, then your kid falls behind, and who knows where, you know, what direction your kid's going to go. And if you're not spending time with your family, you're probably not spending very much time volunteering in your community. So then that starts to, you know, break down that, that social fabric of our communities. And so it's looking at housing that's along uh, transit corridors. I mean, if, if uh, transportation or public transportation is not easily accessible and if it's not efficient, people are not going to use it. And so we need to look at all the tools in the toolbox. I'm glad that we're electrifying Caltrain. That'll increase capacity. We need to be looking at east-west connectivity with, with Samtrans. You know, I, I'm the vice chair of, of commute.org. And I'm very proud of the, the work that our body is doing you know, trying to help with that last mile, getting people from Caltrain, uh, a Caltrain station or BART, that last mile to work, and then from work back to uh, that, that major uh, transit hub. We also need to look at our, our, our kids. You know, if we want our uh, economy to be sustainable, we, we have to, the, the next generation of employees has to come from within. It needs to be homegrown. And so it starts when the kids are very young. We need to have early childhood education so that by the time they get to, to kindergarten, they are ready. If they are behind by the time they get to kindergarten, they will continue to fall further and further behind. And as they get older, in their teenage years, they might not finish high school. And then, of course, we have these kids, these teenagers, many are not going to go to the four-year university. We need to capture them. We need to say, look it, you will we'll help. Sorry, How does this help traffic? So. It's about creating the, the local jobs. If people are living here already, instead of living out you know, in Modesto, you know, I was at this, um, uh, this, this small business, the Auto Collision Center in Daly City, and I was talking with the, the business owner. His youngest employee is 51 years old. You cannot grow your business if you cannot get you know, new people. And, but we gotta educate our kids here and if those if we're if if our the, our next generation of employees is coming from within then they're not living far away they are they're already here you know, Cliff right. brings up an, an important note i think that that and it does have to do with traffic i think the education gap is something that clearly is going to going to have to be addressed in the future you know uh, as a member of the uh, skyline college president's council of which i think three of us are on this uh, that are running. You know, when we started the Skyline College President's Council, it was to, to get more people uh, that were in, that were graduates of high school into college and trying to, to really promote programs that the community needed. And there were a number of pro programs that, that are there that specifically, they've got a great, and I'm, as a graduate of Skyline College, they've got a great automotive uh, section where they turn out a lot of people specifically right. Kids, you know, to do stuff. Using their hands. Um, and, and that's something that we need to utilize 
part of our economic growth is going to be tied to Skyline College and, and the community colleges. And I think that we need to really invest in that. And also, you know, we haven't talked any at all about this change in demographics in this in our county. You've all walked these these these, uh, these streets in, in in the fifth district. There are more people in San Mateo in, in the fifth district that were born in another country than any other place uh, in 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 the county. And because of that 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 demographic shift, we need to be able to address their needs as well. And I think Mike Ring's a good point. Um, I do sit on the with Mike on the Skyline uh, President's Council. We need to look at 21st century jobs, and those 21st century jobs, and Skyline is doing it. It's coding. So making sure that we know people uh, realize that there's coding opportunities for the younger generations. Green jobs. Skyline has a tremendous job, and I've participated in the program, where we can take people and how, how to put a solar panel together. These are the jobs that are built within our, within our community. We have a lot of, lot of young people who have a tremendous amount of talent. We have a responsibility as elected officials to give them the opportunity to unleash it. Let me ask you uh, two quick topics. One is, um, do you support uh, HOV, HOT lanes on 101, which is a carpool lane and or a toll lane on 101 in San Mateo County? A lot of people see those, see those things right now in Santa Clara County, and then they come to a dead stop just around Whipple because those, aren't, those lanes don't exist in San Mateo County. Do you support something like that? Yeah, you know, I'd like to see uh, a part of 101 where it's feasible. Right. You know, from Redwood City to South San Francisco to have uh, an HOV lane. What about a toll lane? Yeah, I need to. I need more information about that. Okay. You know, I, I don't think that yeah. the, the you know the enough study has been done. Yeah. But of course, after you get to South City, it narrows, and you can't you know right. do that. And I've seen the discussion. Um, I think with the board already that, and it may have happened also at Progress Seminar that you know there's a lot of land that needs to be purchased in order to make some of that happen. And here we talk. And there, here we go to eminent domain again, and, and I don't agree with that. So, you know, we have to find a way, you know, to have the uh, the HOV lanes maybe, but not. I don't agree with the toll lane because I think we're taxed enough. Yeah, Mike. No toll lanes. No toll lanes. What For about now, it? I mean, I, you know, the HOV. That's what what I had mentioned. I think that that anything that we can do that promotes connectivity. I, I don't like this idea that that when you get to a certain point, you it either stops or. Does something. We need to do something that that makes it so that there's a flow through and a connectivity. And maybe that need it needs to be done by talking to our adjacent policymakers to determine who's going to pay for it and how it's going to go down. And Mark, then, on, the, on the toll lanes, um, I, I've dealt with them specifically on the city council. The um, city of San Francisco had an idea that they were going to put toll lanes on the border for residents going to and from. Uh, we worked with it. I know Jerry Hill was opposed to it. I worked with the Board of Supervisors. They ended up not moving forward with it. So I'm opposed to the, the toll lanes. Um, I, think it's, um, I think it's an equity issue. But I think when it comes to the HOV lanes, 101, we need to make a commitment. And that commitment is, is to improve throughput. As I mentioned earlier, if we do not have input on 101, the businesses are in dramatic, dramatic trouble. So I'm absolutely opposed to putting a toll, but the HOV lane and infrastructure improvements on uh, Highway 101, I support in its totality. And getting back to connectivity, um, I think we had two different definitions here. Um, when people get off the BART station and they're waiting for, and no offense, they're waiting for a Sam Trans bus, there has to be the link that the Sam Trans bus is there. And so it, time is of the essence, and you know when somebody's working maybe more than one job, and they've got to be there at a certain time, and their boss doesn't like it because they're late due to transportation, it doesn't help. And um, having more shuttles that maybe take people, I'll use the example of the Comabart station, having shuttles for, take um, passengers from there maybe up to 280 Metro or right to Ceremony Shopping Center. And I know that there is, we, we've spoken about this before, there is a duplication of routes, but narrowing the time frame that people have to wait is so important because time is money for not only the employee but the employer. We're starting to run out of time. I, I wanted to ask real quick. San Mateo County has its own measure A. Uh, we're, we're in a sales tax boom. Do you think that the county should get, county currently gives five million dollars a year to Samtrans to help fund its paratransit program. Would you support or at least entertain the idea of the county giving more money to Sam Trans to deal with some of the issues you're This is about? vitally important. Um, I think at the time when there was that allocation, I'd like to see that allocation go either twofold 
or beyond that. We really need to make an investment in, in, in SAM Trans, and I'll tell you why. Daly City has one of the um, most, in, in, in North St. Mateo County, we have a lot of throughput, but if we cannot provide bus services to people, and people who need it the most in terms of income, but we need to put the resources behind that, and I support that. Real quick, Cliff. Yeah, sure. I, 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 we need more money towards uh, SAM Trans and our overall public transportation infrastructure. Helen. Everybody's fighting for Measure A money. I know that they had more requests than were than the, than the money, money. Yeah. and I, I worked on that campaign. Um, it was it was a successful campaign. I hope it when it sunsets that it gets re reacted. But there are so many needy safety net services. That's what it was really put in there for. Yeah, real quick, Mike. should I add to this vigorous agreement? Okay, so yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm for it. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, thank you, Mike Gangona from the Daly City City Council, Helen Fisichero from Colma. David Canaba from Daly City and Cliff Lentz from uh, Brisbane. And thank you for running. This is a difficult thing to do, and I know we appreciate it. I'm Mark Simon. And I'm Kevin Miller. Thanks for being with us, and join us next time on The Game.